Edinburgh Castle is one of Scotland's most famous castles and has been the site of many historical events and is one of the most besieged castles in history, having been besieged 23 times in its long history. Historical Environment Scotland is the lead public body established to investigate, care for and promote Scotland's historical environments and recently they have designed a 3D model of the exterior of the castle. So. Let's explore Edinburgh Castle, starting with the Esplanade. The open area before the castle has been a battleground during bitter sieges, an execution ground for traitors and those convicted of witchcraft, and a parade ground for soldiers. The Esplanade itself was built in 1752. Every August, it hosts the spectacular Royal Edinburgh Military Tattoo. These lines trace the triangular ramparts of the late medieval outer defences of Edinburgh Castle, known as the Spur. This huge structure was built in 1548 to provide the stronghold with an up-to-date bastion for the Age of Gunpowder. It was the focus for every subsequent siege until its demolition in the 1650s. Its remains were revealed by archaeologists in 2010. The Victorian gatehouse was built on the far side of the castle's ancient moat, simply to make the castle look more imposing. Bronze statues of King Robert the Bruce and William Wallace stand guard on each side of the entrance. The eastern side of Castle Rock is vulnerable to attack, and so, since prehistory, it's always been the most heavily defended. In about AD 600, Gododin warriors gathered in a hall on top of the rock, within the ramparts of a hill fort, before they launched a doomed raid into England. This story is recorded in medieval Welsh poetry. The narrow rock gully here has been the entrance to the stronghold since prehistoric times. The gatehouse itself dates back to the 1300s, although it has been rebuilt many times. Almost every visitor has passed through this point, from redcoat soldiers to Iron Age warriors, kings and queens to columns of prisoners, even a regimental elephant. This six-gun battery was built in the 1730s before the final Jacobite rising against the British government. At the time, the castle was still very much a key government stronghold and was re-fortified against an anticipated attack that eventually arrived with Bonnie Prince Charles in 1745. This flight of 70 steps lead directly into the castle's upper ward in the Middle Ages, this was the main route into the heart of the stronghold, once passing through the long-lost Constable's Tower. This world-famous gun sounds a time signal once a day. It first roared into life in 1861 to help sea captains accurately set the maritime clocks needed to navigate the globe. This building started life as a storekeeper's house in the 1600s. It was extended as a cart shed in 1746, after the defeat of the last Jacobite Rising. Now, it is a cafe with spectacular views over the city. These gun platforms and defensive walls were built between 1730 and 1737, as the castle was strengthened during the time of the Jacobite Risings. These prominent defences are out of bounds to visitors to the castle today. They were largely built between 1730 and 1737 by William Adam, Scotland's foremost architect, but incorporate older structures. The upper terrace was constructed in 1858. This is the castle's back door, inaccessible to today's visitors, but visible from the outside. Here, in 1689, Viscount Dundee had a secret meeting with the Duke of Gordon, governor of the castle, to discuss plans to overthrow the government. Dundee then raised the first Jacobite army to attempt to return the deposed King James VII to the throne. 
This gun platform and the turreted staircase next to it were built in 1708 as the castle was refortified amid the time of the Jacobite Risings, an unrest over the Acts of Union between Scotland and England. The battery may have been named for the archery butts or ranges that were installed in this part of the castle in the 1500s. This hospital was built in 1897 to treat sick soldiers. In 1939, four injured German airmen, whose planes had been shot down during the Second World War's first air raid on Britain, were treated here. It now houses part of the National War Museum. The National War Museum explores 400 years of Scotland at war through artefacts, personal treasures, paintings, displays and film. It's based in a former ordnance storehouse dating to the 1750s. Hospital Square is dominated by the 10-ton bronze statue of one of the First World War's most iconic figures, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig, sitting astride his horse, Poperinger. It was commissioned in 1923 by an Indian shipping magnate in recognition of Haig's wartime achievements as commander of the largest ever British army that ultimately triumphed in the conflict. The workshops are used by the maintenance and conservation experts who ensure the castle is kept in good repair and its historic fabric is conserved for future generations. This work has been ongoing ever since the first buildings were raised on the castle rock in prehistory. This Georgian townhouse contains an apartment for the governor and a British army officer's mess, where higher ranks eat, socialise and sometimes spend the night. It was built in 1742 as the residence of the garrison senior officers and within three years it was caught up in the fortress's final siege as Bonnie Prince Charles's Jacobite army blockaded the castle. This vast barrack block is at the heart of the British army's enduring presence at the castle today. With support from civilian staff, the military garrison carries out administrative and ceremonial duties not least looking after the royal family in Scotland. The barracks were built in 1799 for more than 600 officers and men, and a few of their wives. This end of the new barracks houses the Museum of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards, the British Army's elite Scottish cavalry regiment. Its heritage stretches back more than 300 years, with several ancestral cavalry regiments, including the famous Royal Scots Greys. The Royal Scots Museum celebrates four centuries of military tradition and service. Inside what was once the garrison's gymnasium are paintings, uniforms, weapons, dioramas and medals, including seven Victoria Crosses, the UK's highest award for gallantry. These vaults, deep below the castle, were built for storage. They were later used to imprison thousands of prisoners of war from across Europe and America between the 1700s and 1900s. Religious rebels, political prisoners and even pirates were also locked up here. In 1811, 49 French prisoners of war hacked their way through the castle rampart here. They then lowered themselves to freedom down the castle rock on rope made from clotheslines. One fell to his death, the rest escaped, but were later recaptured. This gun battery, named after the military engineer Captain Theodore Dury, was built after the 1708 Jacobite Rising to defend the castle's southern side. It was later used as an exercise yard for the prisoners of war held here. The military prison is a miniature version of a Victorian civilian prison. It was built in 1842 for soldiers from the garrison who were locked up for offences such as drunk on guard. These latrines emptied right down the side of the castle rock. One prisoner attempted to escape by hiding in a vat of human waste that was tipped over the wall. 
the man was caught and dragged back inside. This walkway on the southern side of the Great Hall is not open to today's visitors. It gives access to some of the castle's vaults, including one where prisoners were tortured in the late 1600s, and another where trade unionist David Kirkwood was held without trial in 1918. This is the site of the Register Tower, where the records of Scotland, including a copy of the Declaration of Arbroath, were once kept safe. Many of those documents were lost at sea after being sent to England by Oliver Cromwell. Parts of the tower are now incorporated into later buildings between the Royal Palace and the Great Hall. The innermost gatehouse of the castle leads to the upper ward. It may have gained its name in the 1700s from the veteran soldiers who often guarded the castle in peacetime, Fogey being a nickname for an old soldier. Two water towers were installed in the mid-1800s and early 1900s to provide water for the garrison. They were built within older defences that date from the mid-1500s to 1700s. Visitors seldom get to see inside. The oldest building in Edinburgh was built in 1130 by King David I in honour of his mother Margaret. St. Margaret was a Saxon princess who married King Malcolm Canmore, who appears in William Shakespeare's play Macbeth, and died at the castle in 1093. With her 20-inch wide barrel, Mons Meg was built in 1449 as a fearsome siege weapon. She was given to King James II as a wedding present and was occasionally taken on campaign including on an invasion of England. Mons Meg was later used to fire salutes, including one for the first marriage of Mary, Queen of Scots. This tiny graveyard was set aside for military mascots and soldiers' pets. Among the dogs buried here are Fido, Topsy, Yum Yum and Gip. Some of the animals had accompanied regiments on foreign wars, including Dobler, who travelled with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders to China, Sri Lanka and South Africa in the 1880s. This tower sits directly above the Portcullis Gate. It was added in the late 1800s to the top of a much older gateway. The 16th century lower chamber was once used as a prison, holding the 9th Earl of Argyle before his execution in 1685, and the Radicals Robert Watt and David Downey. This garden was officially opened by Queen Elizabeth II in 2014 to mark the centenary of the start of the First World War. This 34 metre deep well was dug by hand through hard volcanic rock more than 700 years ago. Its meagre supply of water provided an essential lifeline for the castle's garrison during a siege. The four well was filled in by King Robert the Bruce to prevent the English recapturing and using the castle as a bridgehead. This mighty gun platform has terrified approaching attackers and welcome guests to the castle since the 1570s. Designed to house the castle's main guns, it was built around the remains of David's Tower after its destruction in 1573 during the Lang Siege. Its cannons were last fired in anger in 1745 against Bonnie Prince Charles's besieging Jacobite army. Buried within the Half Moon Battery are the ruins of David's Tower. This 30 metre structure once dominated Edinburgh's skyline. Built by King David II as his royal residence, the tower was the scene of the infamous Black Dinner in 1420, at which the teenage Earl of Douglas and his younger brother were executed in the presence of the child King James II. 
The Stuart monarchy stayed here whenever they were in residence at the castle. The oldest part dates to the 1400s, and it has been altered and added to ever since. In 1566, Mary, Queen of Scots, came to the palace to give birth to her only child, the future King James VI. The crown jewels are kept safe here too. The Scottish National War Memorial commemorates more than 200,000 servicemen and women who lost their lives in two world wars and the conflicts that came after. It was opened in 1927 by the future King Edward VIII, watched by thousands, including many wounded veterans, as a lone piper played Flowers of the Forest. The Great Hall was built in the early 1500s for King James IV to show off his wealth, power and sophistication. Banquets were staged here for Mary Queen of Scots and Oliver Cromwell. It was later converted into barracks before being restored in the 1800s. It remains a venue for government receptions, military dinners and state banquets. This building was constructed during the reign of Queen Anne, Britain's last Stuart monarch. Following the Jacobites' rising of 1708 that aimed to restore her deposed father to the throne. It was intended as quarters for military officers and gunners, replacing the former Royal Gun House, where artillery had been kept and repaired. Today, it houses tea rooms and learning spaces. Thank you for Patreon supporter Jerry Mandering for supporting this video. And if you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like. Thank you very much.